welcome to any KVT Rocks. My guest today is Sue Davis, also known as Susan Agatha Davis, depending on which of your many hats you're wearing. You're just back in town. Yes, I got in uh, Christmas Day. How many years in Texas? Six and a half. Wow. I know. My parents passed away in 2015, Ursula and Alice. Mm -hmm. And uh, shortly after their burials, I learned that my grandson, who was four at the time, uh, was diagnosed with Wilms tumor, which is uh, mm -hmm. kidney cancer. Right. So I went down to be with my daughter and be with them through that. And he is now a stage four survivor, and he's 11, and he's a competitive swimmer, mm -hmm. and he's doing great. So it was time to come home. Right. Did you know what you were coming home to? cold weather for one. <laughs> <laughs> I probably could have timed it better. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, it, yeah, I, I mean, it hasn't changed much. Yeah, it, it's sort of interesting because obviously I'm not from around here. Right. But I know it's really hard to go back to where you were because part of you expects everything to be exactly as you left it. And of course it isn't. And yet some things are the same and some things are different. It's very confusing. Well, one of the things that interested me was when I was in Texas, I was living in my daughter's house. Yeah. So I had very limited space, so I didn't right. have very much stuff. So I come back home and I walk into my house and I'm looking around and going, did I go through a hoarding phase and not know it? <laughs> Where did all this stuff come from? And mm -hmm. I apparently I had just, I mean, it, it's not a mess. It's put away on shelves and everything. Yeah. But um, it's a little bit disconcerting. Now my project is to like get rid of half the things I own and pare it down to something rational. <laughs> Isn't that that thing that says if you haven't used something in over a year? I know, goes. but I haven't used anything in seven years. <laughs> right. And I can't throw everything it can all away. go. <laughs> <laughs> so now that you're back, what are you doing? Wow. Um, it's you who have done so many things in the time I've known you. Yes. You have been the editor at the Newport Daily Express. Right. You've been a practicing lawyer, and you yes. still are, I assume. Right? Uh, no, I, I gave up you, my license okay. in 2015. You were a practicing lawyer yes, when I knew for you. for 30 years. What up? You ran for mayor? Um, I ran for mayor. I ran for attorney general for the state of Vermont on the progressive ticket. Wow. Yeah, that was interesting. I believe it was Steve Hinchin that was running for uh -huh. lieutenant governor at the time. Uh -huh. And he had a war chest of about 300,000. And uh, we both got about 5% of the vote. And I spent $56 and change. <laughs> <laughs> so that was interesting. That proves that money is not important for elections. <laughs> Trudy Miller, well, it's, it was, <laughs> they needed somebody to run on that slot. And right. Martha Abbott asked me, and I said, sure, sure why not? I didn't think I had a chance in winning at all, but it was fun and I enjoyed it. It was it was a great. useful experience. It was a great experience. I've had a lot of great experiences. I spent um, I was in the Air Force mm -hmm. as a electronics technician, and then I spent three years living in Europe, uh, in, mostly in Germany, but mm -hmm. I traveled a lot. And while I was over there, I picked up my Bachelor of Arts in English through the University of Maryland's Global Campus. They call right. it the Global Campus yeah. now. Then I came back to the States and did postgraduate work in education at Linden State. Then I was waiting tables because I couldn't get a teaching job. Right. So uh, Bob Gagnon, who at the time, I can't believe I remember all these people's names, who at the time was the assistant attorney general in Montpelier, happened mm -hmm. to be up here doing a murder case. My parents owned the Border Motel at the time. Mm -hmm. And he was coming in, uh, staying there, coming in for breakfast, and we got to talking. And he said, you ought to go to law school. So I applied to three law schools, and they all said yes, so I went. <laughs> so I went to Vermont Law School, um, and at that time I was divorced. I had two little kids, and uh -huh. I was living with my parents. And one day I, I worked for a while for uh, David Drew down in Lindenville, and then I came up here, and I picked up a, um, a criminal case, kind of a pro bono case. It was my mm -hmm. first real trial on my own, mm -hmm. right? And it actually did turn out not to be a trial. It was The case was settled. But Shireen Fisher was the judge. And I w was standing in the, uh, in the lobby at the courthouse, and I said to the court clerk, who's the public defender? And Shireen Fisher comes out and goes, come here. <laughs> she said, apparently Rachel Hexter had been and had uh, resigned that position a uh, uh -huh. few months before, and they hadn't found a replacement yet. So you didn't know I had all these stories. So uh, 
Shireen gets on the phone. At that time, Dave Curtis was the Defender General. And of course, he passed away not too long uh -huh. after that. But she called Dave Curtis and said, I have an applicant for this job. Can I send her down for an interview? And he said, sure. She hangs up the phone and she looks to me and she said, you do have a law degree, right? Uh -huh. <laughs> said, yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah. <laughs> So as it happened, I was really good friends with a, another gentleman down in West, West Barnet. I'm fr originally from West Barnet mm -hmm. in Lindenville. And his name was Elmer Ferris. And Elmer was a good old boy from honor, right? Mm -hmm. And he was in the state legislature. He'd wear bolo ties and the whole thing. Great family. So I, I called him up and I said, well, I'm going to be in Montpelier interviewing on Friday for a job, I thought maybe I'd just stop by the legislature and visit and say hi and sure. you know, if you guys are around. So I did that. I did my interview with Dave and I went over to uh, to the legislature and Sunday morning I get a call from Dave Curtis and says, you have a lot of friends in Montpelier. They're all calling me so I guess I have to hire you. <laughs> I never asked them to. It never occurred to me just, that that would happen. They just did it. Yeah. So I was public defender for four years. And then I ran for county prosecutor for Island Pond, and I did that for four years. Uh -huh. um, and then I was on the school boards, the Vermont Chapter of the American Red Cross board, Adult Basic Education board, Group Moriarty NEK board. NEK TV board. The NEK TV, I keep forgetting that one. Yeah. The NEK TV board, and I was then, and am currently now, on the vestry for St. Mark's. So yes. So here you are, back in town, right. with a very long track record and an open book in front of you. Yeah, several open books in front right. of me, actually. <laughs> I mean, you're getting there, right? You're working yeah. on that class. Um, I started writing, well, I wanted to be a writer since I probably was no taller than this table, mm -hmm. but I started, I wrote my first book when I was in high school, and I was a dorm student at Sacred Heart, and the girl, my girlfriends in the dorm would read it, uh, but that book never found its way to the light of day and my life took other turns mm -hmm. so when I retired so to speak <laughs> I decided I was going to go back to writing so I published my first book in 2013 and I now have uh, seven books published six crime novels and one book of poetry mm -hmm. and I'm working on my seventh crime novel with two more in the works and I have lists of books to write I do not know if I will live long enough to write them all I just have lists, mm -hmm. including a short story series. I might as well put this in. There's a <laughs> short story series called The Adventures of Scoop LaRue, which have to do with a small town newspaper reporter who solves crimes mm -hmm. and is very loosely based on Chris Roy. <laughs> so, does um, he know this? <laughs> yes, he does. Oh, Actually, I, I had him look over the first story. And, yeah. He seemed to enjoy it. It's it's not exactly his life, but it's on that idea. Sure. And the stuff that I write now, as far as as the crime novels go, mm -hmm. crime novels. Hold um, it up, right? Yeah, crime novels. <laughs> the this is um, not that was everybody's the first fair. One, right? This is the second one, actually. Second one. Okay. Uh, I had the first one, but somebody borrowed it for me this week. <laughs> the um, they are what I call gritty adult crime novels. I mm -hmm. did not define them as gritty. Other people who read them told me they were gritty. I thought they were fine, but... <laughs> I, I didn't know that gritty meant they weren't fine. <laughs> well, it, I, yeah, it's edgy stuff. Yeah. Uh, but it has to do with basically drunk lawyers and former military people who shoot first and ask questions later. Right. That kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And they deal with the mob and they deal sure. with all kinds of stuff. So it's fun. It's basically set in Las Vegas, but I also have... Uh, a lot of stories that take off in Philadelphia because one of the characters is from there. So it's sort of... I used to live in Philly. <laughs> it's fun. I love writing that stuff. Um, I also uh, am currently... I just got off the phone last week with the head of the English graduate program at UVM uh -huh. and I will be allowed to finish my master's so hopefully I'll have my MA in English by October. Wow. Um, I'm working on getting a part-time job. I don't want to talk about that because if they hear it, they'll say, I didn't say I was going to hire her, so I'm not going to. And I jinx it, right? <laughs> right. And um, I, I was talking about, hopefully, I'm, I'm trying to get some people interested in doing an independent slash self-published writer's workshop for a day in September. Mm -hmm. So that's that's one of my goals on this year's list. I'd like to do a whole writer's conference, but I thought, we start with about 15 people small and kind of build up. Where are you going to do that? Uh, well, in town here, but I'm not sure. I talked to a few people about locations, mm -hmm. 
and uh, ho- hopefully downtown, maybe in the uh, in Rick's building where the Newport mm. Natural is. Something oh, that's like that. lovely that building upstairs. Yeah, the works, works common, common works. Right. Yeah. So uh, it, it, that's still kind of all up in the air. It's in the planning stage. So I'm working on that. I would bet you would get a lot of people who would be very interested in that. I, I hope so. I'm going to gear it towards Northeast Kingdom, but anybody else in Vermont who feels they come, there is a great uh, literary literature writers festival every year, mm-hmm. but it's only for people who are mainstream published, <laughs> which is very common. And I've yeah. seen it everywhere. I see it in Texas, too. Yeah. So I thought it would be nice. It, it, independent... You can be an independent, in other words, you can be published by somebody, mm-hmm. but it's not mainstream. Right. My books are published by Ursula Down Publishing, okay? But I'm Ursula Down Publishing. That's my company. Right. Right. So a lot of authors do that. They belong to small publishing groups yes. or companies or, or they start their own. And so they are either independently published or they are self published. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we're trying to get Ursula Down back off the ground uh, in hopes to promote. New England authors, uh, and I also have kind of limits on what I want to take right now. Uh huh. Um, I'd love, you know, New England ghost stories are definitely on my list. <laughs> and there are a couple of New England ghost story writers slash investigators. Yes, yes, really in fact, interesting. It's interesting stuff. Yeah. Uh, I don't want to do. Uh, I don't want to do anything. Uh, well, like for instance, I'm not particularly interested in doing memoirs. Now, right. there's there's an exception to that. Which is, I am hoping, uh, when Dexter Randall was alive, mm-hmm. he gave me permission to take his Green Valley notices from Facebook right. and use them for a book. They were amazing. They were amazing. So I had, we had a mutual friend in Lindenville, Patty, yeah. and Patty Baker, and Patty collected all his yeah. online postings for me. And I'm hoping that sometime this year I will find the time to put those into collection. So that's sort of a memoir, but it's right. not. Right, it's, it's different. It's a different. I would bet Dexter also had a bunch of other writings around his home, too. He might have. I have not talked to his family since yeah. his passing, but we have other mutual friends who right. have. Mm-hmm. So there's sort of There's a, ways of finding that out. Right. I'm sure they'd love it. Well, I was a big fan of Dexter's. So. Right. He was a good guy. <sighs> I told you, just give me a push, I'll keep talking. Yeah, keep talking, it's fine. <laughs> we have 30 minutes. <laughs> um, what else have I been doing? The only other thing I think, I, I belong to a number of writing, online writing groups. Mm-hmm. And we do what's called NaNoWriMo, which is N-A-N-O-W-R-I-M-O, which is the National Novel Writers Month. Mm-hmm. And they actually do it several times a year. Right. And it's done by people everywhere in the world, basically. So when we do it online, I belong to a writer's group where I get to do presentations, which is cool because I've belonged to them now for about 15 yeah. years and I get Isn't to Isn't that the group where you are supposed to, you have a month or something like that and you're supposed to churn right. out a novel in that time or at least a framework of a novel? Right. It, it doesn't have to be a whole novel, but yeah. you do set yourself a goal. Yeah. So the common goal is 50,000 words, but I have yeah. to tell you, 50,000 words is Nothing. a lot. It's a lot. When, oh, it's a lot. Right. I, I had this interesting experience. I was, uh, I belonged to the uh, Episcopal Church of the Holy Spirit in San Antonio. And we had a, a discussion one day in which we were talking about jobs and how hard certain jobs are. Mm-hmm. And this friend of mine who was a retired teacher, very, very nice lady, said, well, you know, it's it's real work. It's It's not like writing. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> and I was like, wait a minute. Okay. I said, writing for a living. I mean, I, I'm not making a living at it yet, but I'm working right. really hard at it. Um, it's like spending the rest of your life writing a doctoral thesis every single day. Yeah, one that never ends. Right. <laughs> and she was like, oh, <laughs> I hadn't thought of it that way. When, yeah. I, when I write, I have to do a lot of research. Right. Um, I learned the difference between a Bowie knife and a K bar. Mm. I have to, I, because my guys are police officers and military. I have to spend a lot of time learning about guns. I am not a gun aficionado, but I had a good education from some people who 
called me up and said, that's the wrong, using the wrong gun, kid, you know. <laughs> um, so I've had to At learn. least you can re redo it and edit and change. Well, usually I catch those before they go yeah. to print, right, but that's true. I'm in the process now of revamping all the books. Uh, I'm starting a book four. I just finished the first three. The the plots and this, everything is the same, mm -hmm. but after you finish seven books, you recognize all the things you did wrong. Right. So it's about tightening up the language. It's about making sure I'm writing in the past tense instead of the past perfect tense all the time. It's about getting rid of all the he said, she said tags when you don't need them. Right. Uh, all that kind of thing. Maybe cutting out a whole superfluous paragraph where you're looking at it and going, what does this have to do with anything? You know? You're your and, own editor from a distance. Right. Now that you've had time to distance. Right. And That's the importance of having a good editor. Oh, yes. Initially. Editing, uh, Tracy Ashwood is my editor yeah. with NEK Editing. Uh, she has her own business. She does other things as well, mm -hmm. but that's her her strength. And I find editing, people don't, I don't think they appreciate how complex editing is. It's hard. Yeah. It, and it, you offend people so much, so quickly, <laughs> because they're so attached to every word they've just churned out, and you've just said that sentence is rubbish, it's got to go. Uh, um, well, there's two You've kinds. taken their firstborn and stabbed them. Yes, yes. Um, you cannot, <laughs> as an author, you cannot take editorial critique personally. You can't afford I know, to do it. But people do. But they do. <laughs> yes, that's your baby. And yeah. you know when you turn it out into the world, it's not going to be perfect, but neither are your kids. Right. Right. And at some point, you just have to let them go. Exactly. And hope for the best. The The editing process for me involves, um, I, I tend to write in scenes, and then I tend, so as I say, let's say I'm writing book four. Mm -hmm. As I'm writing book four, I'll get ideas for scenes that may not go in book four. Right. So I'll just make notes and I'll set them aside. Then yeah. when I get a minute, I'll kind of flush it out. So when I get to book five, then I'll go through my list and say, which of these scenes I might get incorporate in book five. Mm -hmm. So it's a little bit like making a patchwork quilt because you've right. already started with some of the pieces. Right, or you're right. doing five jigsaws at the same time. Kind of, but, <laughs> but I'm not doing them all the way because right. that takes too much energy. Most of my books take six to nine months. The last one took two and a half years. Wow was almost 800 pages, um, and it's slightly larger print, you yeah. know, and it's a little bit bigger book, but um, that was because I was halfway through it, didn't like it, started all over again, didn't like it, got all the way to the end, realized the mistake I'd made, went all the way to the beginning, fixed it all the way through, then didn't like the ending again, uh, then rewrote the entire last seven chapters, so, yeah. which by itself took six months. Somebody said, um, to me, what do you do when, when you've gotten to that point in your book, when you realize you, you've screwed it all up? Should I just put it out there the way it is and hope for the best? And I'm like, no. <laughs> no, 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 no. You will <laughs> kick yourself forever, right? So I, I, have a, I have a team. I don't know. Do you know about my team? Mm -mm. Okay. Who are your team? I have a team. I have Tracy in Vermont, who yeah. is the editor. I have Joe in Florida. He is a retired submariner who is my content uh, beta reader. Accuracy. <laughs> yes, and he's the one that calls me on things like, it's a K-bar, not a Bowie knife. Okay, yes, sorry. Um, <laughs> Whatever the, the difference is. <laughs> it's a, there's a difference. I'm sure. <laughs> oh, yeah. I actually have, I don't have that book. I have a picture of the K-bar, <laughs> one of my uh -huh. books. Then I have um, a guy named Nate, Nate Fisher in Spokane, Washington who does audiobook production, mm -hmm. and he just started doing the first book in audio. And we've auditioned a couple of people to do it, a man and a woman. And hes they just got their books, and they're starting to do that read-through now. That's really cool. That is cool. Yeah. Then I have friends of mine in Greece, in the Isle of Samos in Greece, uh -huh. who make my book covers. And that would be Paula and Anthony, who lived up here for a while, yeah. and were married up here. And they did these covers, but we are... We're re as long as we're revising them, we're refreshing the covers mm -hmm. because I now have a series and the books don't look alike. So I want to have covers that have a consistent look to them. Are you keeping the rose? The first three books are about the rose because they have to do with the Dolorosa family. Yeah. But then the other books are about other topics. So we'll have to see how we incorporate that. 
And then I have um, a woman in Buenos Aires who has translated my first book into Spanish. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're getting ready to put a cover on that and get that out there. And she will be marketing through her people as well. And she sells books in uh, Argentina, Uruguay, and Spain. So, <laughs> I have a team. You sure do. Yes. An international team. Yeah, it's fantastic. Computers make life so much interesting. I know. And for all the rude things I've said about Zoom and Zoom equivalents, they do have their uses. Yes, it's great. It's great. Oh. So, yeah, so I, I do, I'll write a chapter or two or three. And I'll get a hold of Joe down in Florida, and I'll say, um, I'm sending you these chapters. Tell me what you think. Mm -hmm. And he's a huge fan of mine. Good. <laughs> uh, yeah, which helps. But he's uh, uh, he's the one who'll call me on things. He'll say, you know, I I've been reading the same character for the last three books, and you did this over here. And I, I don't think he would do that. <laughs> that that's good feedback. That's a, hey, you know, um, Joe is fantastic. And... Then uh, then I get it back from him, and then I re-edit it again, and then I do a few more pages. And by the time I'm about two-thirds through the book, I start sending them to Tracy. Because by then, I, I have a pretty good idea of where I'm going. Right. Except the last one when I then had to say, okay, you know all that editing you're doing? Stop Forget it. rewriting the whole last seven chapters. And then I do, I run it through uh, the Word, my Word program, edit program. Mm -hmm. And then I run it through Google Docs edit program, which gives you different answers. Fascinating. And then I run it through Grammarly, which gives you another set of different answers. A spell check. <laughs> and spell checks and everything. But by the time you get to Grammarly, the kind of stuff you're getting is more suggestive than necessary. Right. You know, if somebody will say, they keep insisting I do this and I don't want to do that, well, then don't do that. Right. Right. It's not as though we speak in the way that Grammarly writes. Right. Right. We speak as we speak. Sometimes it catches it's dramatically mistakes. appalling. <laughs> right. It catches mistakes and things, and you look yeah. at it and say, yeah, but I intended for it to be spelled that way. Yeah. Okay. So that's, you go from there. So then I do audio, which means I put earphones on, mm -hmm. and I put my reader on, and I put it up on the screen, and the computer reads the thing to me. And that's where you catch bad, mistaken words, mm -hmm. where you put, you thought you typed they and you typed there for some right. reason, right? And you didn't catch it. All. Right. Because it it's really hard to catch stuff. It's very hard to catch. Particularly on a screen. Especially if you've seen it so many times. Right. Right? Because you, you know what should be there. Yeah, exactly. Not what is there, but what should be there. The other thing it catches is if you repeat words too often. Yeah. So somewhere you use the word incident, and then you realize, I just used incident three times on that same paragraph yeah. or on that same page. Then you can go back and you hear it. Bring out your very own little th thesaurus. <laughs> then I send it to Tracy. Yeah. Then Tracy sends it back with all kinds of notes. Of course. And uh, sometimes I change things and sometimes I don't and sometimes we argue. Uh-huh. <laughs> of course. And, and then she does the formatting and she sends all the, all the measurements and statistics over mm -hmm. to Anthony and Paula in Greece and they do the cover. Wow. So it's yeah. It's tech. Huh? It's high tech, and yeah, unlike the traditional approach to writing, which is you send your manuscript off somewhere to a publishing company, they accept it or they reject it, and then you send it somewhere else. But they take over the detail. They after take that. over the details. Well, They'll that's, tell you to rewrite. You but, can still do that. Yeah. The yeah. problem, and there are a lot of people who will tell you, and they may be right about this. Mm -hmm that the majority of uh, independent or self-published authors just aren't any good. <laughs> That's probably okay. true. <laughs> You'll hear that all the yes. time. And that may very well be true. Um, yeah. I've been fortunate because I have a strong background in English because I'm writing detective novels and right. I was a criminal lawyer. Right. And <laughs> people who read my books um, give me great reviews. Uh -huh. They love them. Quite often what I'll do is I'll give them the first one and then right. they'll, and they'll say, "Well, I'm going to read it because you know you're my friend, and I'll read it." And sure. then they'll call me up and say, "When's the second one coming out?" You know, I have to have the second one. Right. So, so now I have a little fan club kind of thing going, which is kind of cool. Do you have a Facebook page for your I, writing? I do. Uh, I have a Facebook authors page, 
And I also have a regular author's page, but it is down right now because I'm revising it. Mm -hmm. So it should be back up in 30 to 60 days. Great. I, I'm refreshing it, yes. So people who are interested have ways of contacting you. Right. Because it's not as though they can walk into a regular store and find your book easily. They can find well, it. Well, okay. <laughs> you can find them on Amazon. Right. Obviously. Um, all of my books are on Amazon right now. <laughs> the first four of my books have been picked up online by Barnes & Noble. Cool. Yeah, I know. I don't even know how that happened. Right. Right? I didn't. I don't know how it happened. It's just one day Tracy called me up and she said, did you know you're on Barnes & Noble? And I, I was like, okay. Um, so that was nice. And that is nice. <laughs> I've got um, the poetry books. I sent them down to Mac to be reviewed yes. for, you know, if they can put them there. And they're also at Nevermore Books in, in Newport. And Larry at Nevermore is interested in my crime novels. Right. So I have to order those, but because I'm in the middle of putting new covers on them, that's going to be a few weeks down the line. going to have to wait, right. Um, yeah, we haven't talked about your poetry. Is that your first book of poems? This is my first book of poetry. I don't know if I'll get around to a second or not. This, this is I enjoyed book, that book. 50 years <laughs> in the making. <laughs> yeah. Um, the, I've been writing poetry for years and years and years, forever, forever. And when I was doing my graduate work at the University of Vermont in 1998, I was a co-winner of the Vermont Poetry Award for the, mm. for the, the university. And so this is called Winter on the Farm. Unlike my crime novels, this is much more sedate. <laughs> As is Winter on the Farm. As in Winter on the Farm. And it has a few kind of slightly edgy poems. Uh -huh. um, there's one about a, a weekend affair at the airport Marriott. <laughs> uh, <laughs> there's one about um, it's just different things. A yeah. friend of mine who passed away young from Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. I have a poem about him. I have a poem about, uh, well, I could read them, but, uh, you know, I, 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 if I start reading them, I'll be in trouble. Right. <laughs> I have a poem about um, veterans growing old it, uh -huh. and, and basically sitting around the table and talking about, it's called Independence Day, remembering what independence means right. and then getting up with their canes and their walkers and going out to the flatbed truck yep. with their flags <laughs> and their, yeah. right? While the people out in the audience are on the audience here along the street, consists of young kids with six inch flags who have no idea what that means, and no. more recent veterans who are, you know, sleeping in parks and and, and mentally shattered. Yes, so it yeah. it deals with those kind of issues. Um, I have a very short poem about the bombing of Iraq called "Until This Night." So that's mm -hmm. it was just basically about how. You're going along with your life, and something happens, and right. the world blows up. Right. So, so yeah, I have quite a bit of collection poems about my grandmother. Yeah. I did not include the poem about my mother because I'm still dealing with angst over that. <laughs> That'll be the next book. Maybe the next book. Yeah. 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 We'll see. Yeah. Do you ever teach young people writing? Um, I have not writing per se. I back years and years and years ago, I did student teaching and that sort of thing. Yeah. So I was at North Country, uh, and that was fun. I taught Canterbury Tales there. That oh was wow! <laughs> yes, I had these two young boys in my class who I will not name because they're all grown up and probably grandparents by now, and they they were brothers or cousins or something, uh -huh. and they were the troublemakers in the class. Uh huh. So I put them in charge of the debate over whether or not morality should be taught in literature. And they both showed up for school in suits. Wow. I know. <laughs> that was an interesting experience. I taught uh, at community college for um, business law and legal research and writing years and years ago, mm -hmm. you know, as a, uh, what do you call it, adjunct. Mm -hmm. I love teach. I would love to teach writing courses to anybody. I mean, why I don't just, you? Well, I have to get paid. <laughs> you I, find me a job, I will get. I <laughs> would think that there are ways of making that happen. I, I doubt that it would pay well, but um, I don't need to be paid well. And yeah. actually, that's a horrible, horrible thing to say. For, I have spent my whole life with the. I don't know if you call it a philosophy exactly rule of thumb maybe mm -hmm. or however you mm -hmm. want to put it that I will do what I need to do 
and God will take care of the rest. And and I'm not uh, I'm not advocating that as a right wing religious mm-hmm. whatever Go you know on. what I mean. <laughs> But yeah, because I, I don't care how you framework yeah. that. You know, with Wayne Dyer has said, you know, God doesn't care what you call him. You can call him peanut yeah. butter and jelly sandwich. Um, but but it's the universe will provide yes. the last effect. Put your piece in yes. and the universe will fill and in the rest. I don't know how many times I have sat there and said, I need help here. <laughs> right. you know? And it's always come through for me. Always come through for me. So I I feel very blessed that way, but um, but you have to pay that price, and the yes. price I paid for that is I've had a, a very <coughs> interesting career in which I made no money <laughs> or very little money. Right. Right. So you been know, there, done that. <laughs> been there, done that. So I would like to make some money teaching writing. I don't. But when you say when when somebody like me says. But I don't need to make a lot of money. We're kind of like putting a message out into the universe mm-hmm. that says, don't send me money, right? So it's it's what we call deprivation mentality. And, and right. you want to get away from that, too. So I'm I more, agree. now that I'm, I just turned 70. So now that I'm older, I'm like, yeah, I would like a little money <laughs> at this it point would in my life. It would be nice if it wasn't all a struggle. Yeah. So on that note, we do have to stop because okay. we are out of time. It, it goes really fast. And you thought you were going to ask more questions. <laughs> I just put in little prompts, and fortunately, you're somebody who can just <laughs> fill the space, which is much um, appreciated from where I sit. <laughs> well, it's a pleasure. And this was fun. And hopefully, when you start doing workshops or you're having your readings, that that's something we can also talk about. Oh, certainly. Come back. And welcome back to town. I'm glad you're back. (laughs) (laughs) Thanks. Now I just have to survive winter and I'll be fine. (laughs) Yeah. But, you know, we're on the swing into spring. The geese are back. The geese are back? Yeah, there's two of them in Gardner Park as I came along the causeway. I have a poem on that here, too, you know. Right? Okay. Okay.